talk a lot about that. We're not really organizing people. We're organizing production, and that's where the strength lies. And it doesn't take long to analyze the fact that in 1950 there were 6.5 million farmers on the land. Today there's less than three. And so the volume within the structure of the organization has had a steady positive growth. But we haven't been satisfied and we have tried to analyze why we have not been able to appeal to those who may be standing around on the perimeter and watching. We have become involved in some training our executive people have so that they could function more completely. Our staff has undergone training so that they can fulfill their role more completely. And most recently, we felt the need to ask someone else what we could do to be more successful because we knew the race was on. And we sensed that the climate that has been spoken of here today by those who stood here was fast approaching and that we needed and we have talked about time running out and we have cried wolf and we know the dangers of that but we sense that this climate was building rapidly and that if there was some way that we could expedite and move our programs more rapidly to serve fill that need that we had that responsibility to do that we have never had a, an official poll within the organization conducted, and we chose to do that about a month ago, a little over a month. We have the final results of that. We have not been able to completely analyze and determine the direction, but we know now what farmers and ranchers want. Seventy percent and I'm going to give you more detailed figures. Let me back off. We picked 10 states, the heavy agriculture Midwest states. And in those 10 states, we went to the national directors and said we would like to have a list of 150 farmers and ranchers that have a gross income of $100,000 or more. We want to know what those people are thinking. We want 50 of them to be members of the organization. We want 100 of them to be potential members. The list came in, 1,500. Calls were made by a professional opinion research group who had had some affiliation with Gallup, and they called 500 of these people at random to give us that input that would help us perform more completely. These are some of the results that I can give you. There's much more that we'll be analyzing and extracting from there. The one issue, and people, this is a hard one to swallow. I knew it, but I never did want to admit it. The problem that we have is an image problem. It isn't what we are, but it's what people think we are because they don't know what we are. Now that's a challenge to take and change that. And that's a slow, long, hard process. How do you do it fast? You don't. 70% of those people in that group said they want collective bargaining. They want representation at the marketplace. They want some legislative protection. And what they don't know is we got what they want. And somehow we have got to reach out there and get those people. That poll said 30% would never become involved in this organization regardless. 
But I venture to say if those 70% do, half of the 30 will too. So it's out there for the asking if we can reach them. Now we have to figure out some way to do it. And as one professional person told me not too long ago, you have the best kept secret in America. When we were talking about collective bargaining, he was telling me privately what farmers and ranchers needed. And I said, that's exactly what we got. And he said, you got the best kept secret in America. Well, as we analyze these figures, we're ready to take the next step. We think we know what we're going to do. There's some things that are standing in our way. You know, you only do what resources will allow you to do. And to change that image, it takes some type of a PR, a public relations firm that helps. Now, they can't do it all, but they can help. And the scary thing is, is if you become involved with one of them for a year, it'll probably cost you from three to four hundred thousand dollars. Well, I don't know. What's it costing us now? Not doing what needs to be done. We have to analyze all the pros and cons and then make our decision as to the next step. We will start the 1st of January interviewing, looking at, listening to PR firms and their suggestions on how to improve the image of the organization. And it goes back years and years and years. What someone said, they thought they heard someone say. But still, it's embedded there that it must be dealt with. And we're going to accept that challenge, and we're going to move in that direction. Well, are we asking too much when we talk about cost of production plus a profit? Are we being unrealistic? Are we asking for more than we are allowed? Are we being greedy? I want to give you some statistics to compare so that you'll have some idea of our feeling and reaction to that question. In 1965, the consumer disposable income for food in this country was 20%. In 1975, it had dropped to 18%. And in 1980, it had dropped to 14%. And when you visit with the press who are consumer-oriented, the first thing they say is, if you're successful, it's going to cost the American people more for their food. And I submit that's true, and it's about time. <laughs> they have got so much for so little, for so long, they feel it's a God-given right to protect it. Now. We talk about the rate of inflation. If it hadn't have been for agriculture, not willingly, but because they had no alternative to supply food to the American consumer, inflation would have been much greater than the percentages that you hear and read about. But the reason that it was at a level that you read and hear about is because your farm debt put food on the table. And your farm debt allowed them to buy that second car and that boat and that summer home. And I submit that it must come to an end. You know, our wives like a new rug on the floor, and they like a new stove and a new couch, along with other people's wives. And we have the responsibility to see that we provide for them as others do. And I don't think any consumer really expects us to feed them below our cost.
But I think they don't have a way to deal with the issue if they so chose. How would they do it? If that consumer there on Main Street had some desire to see that you got more for your meat and your milk and your grains, how would they do it? They have no way or no system, and the only way it can become a reality is if you design the system, and then you extract it from that first handler. And as you extract it there, then they participate in paying for the food that sits on the table. Are you up to the challenge? A hundred and... <clears throat> 150,000 farm units left the farm in 1981. There is 12 square miles of agriculture land, prime land, being converted to non-agriculture use every day. This is our industry. This is mine. It's yours. And it used to be heard as we talked about the impossibility of dealing with the economic issue. Well, if we can't make it on the farm, we'll go to town and we'll get another job. Well, I'll tell you, the jobs aren't there, people. You're not going to town because the unemployment line has already formed. And it has come time that you're going to have to take a stand and not allow that transfer of ownership to take place because of lack of adequate income. And how are you going to do it? Well, tomorrow you'll get into the details of how. But I want to touch very quickly, very briefly, on some things that I think can keep this from happening. We have our departments. They're staffed. They have that capability of performing a function that you and I are wanting. If, in fact, you recognize that you have need for an appendectomy in your family, you don't take the youngster and lie him out on the table and get the medical book and one hand and a knife in the other and go to work on them. You don't do that. You go to a specialist who is trained in that field one who knows how to get results and deal with the issue. And that, you must understand, too, is a field where a specialist must step in and give that protection in the marketplace that that 70% in that survey said they wanted, they needed, they couldn't go there by themselves. And as we look at the capabilities of the department and their successes, there are many. We can talk about some of them. We've had our share of disappointments as well. But I recall a story that was told to me just the other day by one that participated in an interview Howard, I'm going to talk about you for just a minute, if you don't mind. Howard Fisher was called in to an interview at a television station, and the moderator said to him the opening statement, how come the National Farmers Organization has been able to lead the cow market for the past 12 months in this area? Now, he says, I know you have because I have checked the figures. It's true. Those are the type of stories that we need to tell to prove our effectiveness.
We take a look at the contracts being negotiated on hogs. When we're able to take and negotiate a contract that will return to our producers net dollars, we have the ability to do it. We have the people. Well, dairy, we've been able to increase our volume some 12% in the last year. We project another substantial, at least comparable, increase in the next year. And it's simply because people are recognizing the capabilities of negotiating and the importance of forward contracts, supply contracts. And I've said many, many times that at some point, agriculture is going to embrace contract farming. By this, I mean that you will have contracts for commodities that have not been planted or harvested when you go into the farm credit people for capital, for operating capital. And we're fast approaching that type of an atmosphere. This has a twofold purpose. One, it will give the producer some stability in his budgeting process. It will give the farm credit people assurance of your ability to repay. And how many times have we come to you and others and pleaded that you get involved in a forward contract process so that we could lock down gains and build from that point forward? And nearly without exception, that advice has been sound and solid and would have given we, the producers, that protection that we so sorely need. Well, I want to talk about two other things that are vitally important to this organization. Frank talked to you this afternoon in grain about what is recall, uh, called the VIP program, Volume Incentive Program. I happen to be one of the producers that doesn't produce a lot of grain, perhaps five, ten thousand bushel. But I know this, that all the five and ten thousand bushel producers in the country cannot cause that market to react favorably for we five and ten thousand bushel producers. And when we have the ability to reach out and unfortunately, a lot of our own members would move a portion of their grain through the system, through the structure of the organization, through program marketing, and then they'd take the balance and go somewhere else. And so we felt that we needed to design a way where we could attract those producers that, would, that we would really benefit from if they would participate with us. Their participation could give us some protection wherein we didn't have the ability to protect ourselves. And so I become a recipient of the program because of their strength, their strength that I'm drawing on. And that program is sound, and that program will work. And you and I will draw strength from those people who have been standing on the perimeter watching. It will give us some ability to be more competitive in non-competitive areas. And I submit and encourage that you embrace that program and study it very carefully, because therein lies a success. And as Frank said, you know, we have never had the luxury of not selling grain. We set up a structure. And that overhead of that structure, I don't know what the cost is, but I'm going to guess 300000 a month. I could be off a little, but not too far. But to maintain that structure, that's approximately the cost of it. And if the grain does not move, then that structure becomes an albatross, really. And at the desire or determination to move grain, that depends on how strong the structure is. 
We'd like to be in a position to advise and say to our membership, it doesn't look like a good time to move grain right now. You make the decision, but it appears to us that maybe we ought to wait 30 days or 60 days. And we haven't had the ability to do that because of the overhead cost. And under this program, we will have more flexibility. We'll have more ability to make decisions that will affect marketing, bargaining, that those markets make available as we bargain and negotiate on these contracts. Another program that becomes very important to the organization, some 10 years ago, we decided as the leadership of the organization that it was important that we establish an office in Washington. We're not so naive to think that you can live outside the political system. You're a part of it and you will live within that system. And so you use that system to the best ability that you have and capitalize on its existence because it's there. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of confidence in it doing anything for farmers. Our experience has taught us otherwise. But nevertheless, they can legislate you and I out of business overnight. They can cause bills and amendments to be enacted that would threaten almost at will the very existence of collective bargaining. And so we established that, wa that office for two or three reasons. One, to be a watchdog and watch for any attempts or threats that may be posed against this organization. About two years ago, the board of directors decided that it was now becoming such a political football and the element there was becoming so tense that we had to have some ability to have greater influence there. And we saw those who were standing around the side who may be on the other side of the fence developing methods and procedures to protect their interests. And they were des designing what is referred to as PAC committees, political action committees. These political action committees had the ability to help fund the campaigns of many of these influential congressmen. And it became very apparent that our ability to work with them was becoming less and less because we could not participate in some of those fundraisers that influenced those congressmen and their votes. Unfortunate as it is, that's the way the game's played, people. And we can talk and we can criticize it, but that's the way the game's played. And when they get ready to have a fundraiser campaign, they send out the invitations. They expect you to participate, and if you don't, when you call, they don't answer the phone. And you have to make up your mind whether you want to be able to talk to them by phone or stand in line and hope that they get tired of seeing you stand there. The Board of Directors chose that we set up a PAC fund that would give us some ability because we knew the strength of the opposition. The strength of the opposition was pumping into millions and millions of dollars. We don't have that ability. We don't intend to. But there has to be some genuine effort to get involved in that type of an activity in a political atmosphere. And so I recommend strongly to you as delegate body that you participate in as members. I firmly believe that the politics of this country will be run by PAC funds at some point in the future. But that 5 and $10 that you and I may participate as a contribution will have little or no meaning. And that those who have established a PAC fund, which all now have done, every farm group has them, commodity groups, every consumer group, they have their fund. 
And the politics in this country will at some point be run by those committees because of the funding that will come from them. Now, people, we have to recognize that that's the game that's being played if you want to have an influence of any kind in the legislative process to protect your interests. What do we got coming up? Well, the bargaining bill is back on the platter again. You've got to have some ability to influence the vote on that bill because it will challenge collective bargaining. And there will be others that continually crop up, amendments that will be attempted to be attached to, and you have to have, I say you, through that fund, Chuck has to have the ability to pick up the phone and call. And without that, he cannot function and do it. And so before you leave the convention, stop and talk to Chuck and his staff. They'll help you understand it better than I because they're on the front line. They're there. Well, I want to close in just making a few very brief comments. The challenge that lies ahead, people, has never been greater. Our responsibility we have never sensed more keenly than we do now. And as we talked this morning and as some reported, it appears as though net farm income will be less next year than this by statistics not of our making. That interest rates will not give you the relief that you need. Farm markets, as we look at them, will not. And there is only one way that we can protect our economic interests. And that's for you and I that are here is to band ourselves together in sufficient strength that we can protect or assist in protecting. And then those that are standing on the fringe who don't know what we are, we reach out and help them understand because they want to become a part of our program and they simply don't know how. We're going to accept that part of the challenge and we want you also to help. Are you up to it, people? The battle's there. You ready? <laughs> we'll give the leadership, but I'll tell you, it's a pretty lonely job to be a general when you turn around and the troops are gone. As long as them troops are there, I'll tell you, we'll go through fire. We'll give the leadership that we believe must be given. We know when to push and pull. We know when to back off. We know when the time's right to hit. You understand the principle of collective bargaining and let us implement the fundamentals. It's good to be here with you tonight. Our convention will continue, of course, tomorrow as you meet with the departments. And I think you're going to be impressed with the caliber of people there, the message that they're going to have for you, the program that you're going to reacquaint yourself with. Thank you, and good night. <clears throat>